there's been a controversy going on for a year or so on the American left as to whether or not workers in the catering trades, in particular workers in coffee shops, are productive workers. So it seems a rather strange debate to me, but uh, I thought it's worth intervening on this because it shows misunderstandings about what is meant by productive work. Um, I, in the course of the video I will show clips from Twitter conversations about this. The distinction between productive and unproductive labour originates in the works of the economist Adam Smith and I'm quoting a passage from Smith here. The rent of land and the profits of stock are everywhere therefore the principal sources from which unproductive hands derive their subsistence. These are the two sorts of revenue of which the owners have generally the most to spare. They might both maintain indifferently either productive or unproductive hands. They seem, however, to have some great predilection for the latter, that is to say, employing unproductive hands. The expense of a great lord feeds generally more idle than industrious people. The rich merchant, though with his capital he maintains industrious people only, yet by his expense, that is, by the employment of his revenue, he feeds commonly the very same sort as the great lord. Smith is writing at a time when the upper classes, whether the aristocracy or the merchant capitalist classes, employed vast numbers of domestic servants in their houses. And he's saying that these unproductive hands, the unproductive workers, are supported out of two sources. The profits of stock, that is to say, the profits of the capitalist class, and secondly, the rent of land, which is rent that the landlords charged to the peasantry or to the capitalist farmers that operated their fields. And from this unproductive, from this revenue stream, they could employ servants, and the servants were unproductive workers. The key points here are that unproductive workers are supported out of the revenues of the upper class, and productive workers are those who are a source of revenue to the upper class. Marx basically agreed with this. Productive workers, according to Marx, are those who produce surplus value for the capitalist class. Smith has a secondary definition. He says that productive work is that which fixes itself in a vendable commodity which persists after the work is done. Services like those of a clown or an opera singer, he says, which vanish in the moment of their performance are not productive. Now Marx disagreed somewhat with this and thought that some forms of services that vanish in the moment of their performance could actually be productive. But I, I'm not going to go into them because that's not what is the source of the dispute in um, the American left at the moment. So I'm going to stick with Smith's more restrictive definition, more restrictive than that of Marx. What links Smith's two definitions? That's because he's concerned with productive capital accumulation. If a capitalist spends his income on servants, clowns, opera singers, prostitutes, what have you, then he fails to accumulate. That's obvious. And secondly, accumulation has to be physical, either as means of production or as what the classical economists call the wage fund. 
by which they meant the stock of food and necessities left over at the end of the year which could be used to support workers in the next year. And hence immaterial services couldn't lead to accumulation. Couldn't lead to accumulation either of variable capital in Marx's terms or constant capital. Now technological changes alter this. With the advent of microphones and recording technology, even an opera singer could become productive. If she sang into a microphone and it was recorded, her labour fi became fixed in a vendable commodity, in records, which could then be sold as a commodity by the capitalists. And that's how the record industry became a major new field of capital accumulation in the 20th century. What about things like cashiers? Did they become productive? No. With the development of department stores, work like cashiering became a definite branch of the division of labour. But they are still supported out of revenue. It's not so easy to see in this case, but it's because selling things doesn't add value. It merely enables the owner of the shop to get a share of the value that were in the goods when they came into the shop, when they came into the store, that had been created in the industry that made the goods. So the wages of cashiers merely were paid out of the pre-existing surplus value, the stream of surplus value that the merchant capitalist was appropriating. The share of the surplus value produced in the industry that went to merchant capital and they had a deduction from that surplus value to pay the cashiers that collected the money. Now what about baristas? I mean the, there seems to be a fetish about this in the US. Um, some claim that the, the baristas aren't productive. But any worker who prepares food and drink is productive. If they prepare food and drink which is sold as a commodity, they're productive. If they are the personal cook of Bill Gates, who prepares a meal in his house, then no, they're not productive. But if they're employed as employees of Costa's or Starbucks to, to produce coffee and sell it, certainly they're productive. They produce a commodity that's consumed by the general population. They perform surplus value and that surplus value profits the employing firm and it profits the landlord that owns the building in which the coffee shop is placed. We can look at that concretely. Let me add up. I'm taking figures from Britain, from the big British chain Costa, not Starbucks. A flat white at Costa currently costs £3.90. A cup requires roughly 10 grams of beans. Even you or I can go out and buy coffee in one kilogram bags for £10 a kilo. I'm sure Costa buying 50 kilogram bags can get it a lot cheaper or substantially cheaper. But let's assume that it, the, the price of one of 10 pounds a kilo. So 10 grams of coffee would cost about 10 pence. I'm guessing they put 200 mils of milk in one of their cups of coffee. That may be a slight underestimate, a slight overestimate. I know that they buy standard supermarket bottles of milk because you can see them in the fridge. Those sell at 145 per two litre bottle of milk. So we're talking about 14 pence for milk. They then have to raise per 
for their large cup, 455 mils of water, either in the form of milk or in the form of ordinary water, to a boiling point. That can certainly be done for less than five pence of electricity. And let's assume, as Costa often does, that they will hand it out in a paper cup. So you, it's a. We're looking at a case where Costa is selling it for you to go out the door. They're not providing seating as part of the price. So, and it's a paper cup there. For so we don't have to take into account the labour of washing the cup. If we add up all these elements of constant capital that are consumed in one cup, it amounts to 35 pence. The cup of coffee was 390, so 355 is the value added to C by living labour. I've looked up postings by baristas where they discuss how long it takes them to prepare a cup. And they reckon that if they're preparing a cup of a milky coffee and working fast, they can do it in about 90 seconds. Um, so 90 seconds work, cost us pay £10.75 70 an hour base minimum wage so that the variable capital expended by Costa to make one cup of coffee is 26 pence. That means that the surplus value is £3.19 which amounts to a 1200% rate of exploitation, an extremely high rate of exploitation. Now it may be said that I've missed out the depreciation of the coffee making machine uh, depreciation of the um, wear and tear on the bar surface, a few things like that. Those will be a very small additional amount, perhaps a few pence per cup of coffee. So clearly there is a lot of exploitation growing on there. There's no way that someone is going to pay that price for 10 grams of coffee beans. It's the labour of the baristas who first have to put the beans in a machine to get gr grind it to get grounds. They then put it in the receptacle of the espresso machine. They tamp it down. They put it into the espresso machine. They operate the valves of the espresso machine to let high temperature steam and water through it. They allow that to dribble into a small cup. They transfer the small cup to the large cup that the person is going to be served in. They then use a steaming machine, measure out 200 mils of, of milk, steam it in a jug until it foams up, pour the, 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 the foamy milk onto the, the cup that's being served, and that's the final stage. It's a labour-intensive process not an automated process. So it is in Marx's terms handarbeit or manufacture. Now what are the alternative explanations some of the leftists are giving? One of them is that it's it's just rent. Uh, the reason for the upscaling of prices at the site of purchase is a matter of rents not a matter of labour. Well the problem with this is that according to Marx's volume 3 of Capital Rent is a portion of surplus value. It is value created by labour, which is then divided three ways into profit, interest and rent. Rent constitutes one part of the surplus value produced by labour. So if the owners of a Costa shop charge Costa Coffee Company rent for the shop, well, they're getting a share of the surplus value that the workers in that shop produce. Another objection is, oh no, the barista's labour accounts for only 5% of the commodity. 95% of the real value already exists in the commodity. Well, 
basically they're saying all oh, the value was created by the coffee farmers well that's not the case if you do a concrete analysis of it um, my calculations sh shown that the beans bought at market prices therefore bought at their value bought at the same price that anyone else buying the coffee beans would pay only have a very small fraction of the value of a, a cup of coffee in them um, it, if it were 95 percent at the current prices of coffee beans a cup of coffee would have to contain over 300 grams of coffee beans more than a packet and a half of standard coffee beans now anyone who's ever drunk a cup of coffee knows that it doesn't contain that amount of coffee beans so this is a, a ridiculous suggestion um, really if people are going to draw figures out like this they should have some backing for them they shouldn't just invent them you have to actually do some costings you have to look at wages you have to look at the amount of, t of concrete labor it takes or the labor time therefore the abstract labor that it takes to perform the task and you have to look at what are the values of the raw materials used Unless you do that, you can't do a concrete analysis and you live in a fantasy world.